Oh, thank you, Tina, for that very inspiring introduction. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, Belgium is really very well known for its outstanding psychology research. And it's so wonderful to hear your thinking of further expanding your mental health services. Um, no two countries are the same. And so I'm sure you won't want to do just what I'm going to show you we do in England. Um, but I hope that some of the ideas that have proved helpful in England will also be of interest as you find your own way to try and really um, realize the mass potential of evidence-based psychological therapies. And that's really going to be my focus today. So the first thing to say is that there has, in the last 20 or 30 years, been really very considerable progress in developing effective psychological therapies for most common mental health problems. Some of those therapies are things that have been around for a while, and we've just got good uh, randomized controlled trials that have demonstrated their value. Some others have turned out not to be so valuable in the trials, and new therapies have also come on and been supported by the evidence. Um, in England, we have a body called NICE, the National Institute for Clinical and Care Excellence, which is a government body which is charged with the job of impartially reviewing the evidence base uh, for interventions across the whole of medicine. And if it finds itself convinced that certain things work, issuing recommendations, they should be made available. And occasionally, if it finds evidence that something is harmful, also issuing recommendations that it shouldn't be made available in the health service. And starting in 2004, NICE issued clinical guidelines on the treatment of common mental health problems, depression, all of the different anxiety-related problems, including post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and also uh, eating disorders and some of the personality disorders. And all of those guidelines indicate that certain psychological therapies are first choice interventions for those mental health conditions. Of course, in most cases, medication is also effective and NICE recommends medication as well. But it gives particular priority to psychological treatments because the idea of a psychological treatment is that you will develop some skills not only to overcome your current emotional problems, but to help you face adversity in the future. So you learn some new way of dealing with emotional problems. And medication doesn't do that. And so that's really why the recommendation is more strongly for psychological therapies. So that's the good news. The bad news, oh, and these are the sort of range of treatments that are recommended by NICE. So I'm going to be largely talking about depression and the anxiety disorders. NICE recommends quite a range of psychological treatments for depression. It recommends CBT, but also equally strongly, actually, interpersonal psychotherapy. Uh, and for the more mild to moderate cases, also couples therapy, brief psychodynamic therapy, um, and uh, certain forms of counseling. And if you're looking at relapse prevention, it also recommends mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, for the different anxiety disorders, currently it recommends specialized forms of CBT. Um, and then you can see for other conditions, we have family therapy coming in, uh, dialectical behavior therapy. So there are a range of evidence-based psychological therapies. That's the good news. And a bit more good news, this just shows you the sort of power of some of these therapies. So um, this is uh, our latest uh, randomized controlled trial of uh, treating people with severe social anxiety disorder. And uh, what you've got here is a histogram looking at the severity of people's social anxiety before uh, starting a course of cognitive therapy for social anxiety disorder. And uh, this is a, a measure of how severe um, the social anxiety is. The clinical, non-clinical cutoff is here. So everyone's in the clinical range, and some of them are in the milder end, but the majority are uh, moderate to severe. Um, what I'd like to show you now is what happens to that distribution when people have gone through a three-month course of cognitive therapy and we follow them up for a year after the end of treatment. Why am I showing you a year after the end of treatment? It's because simply getting people better isn't the goal. The goal is keeping them well, 
as well. So you need, for all of these treatments, to look at a longer-term follow-up as well. As you can see, the whole distribution has moved massively uh, to the left. The majority of people, 70%, are in the non-clinical range. And more or less everyone else has shown some benefit, but we don't have any psychological treatments that work for everyone. And you can see in this particular graph, we have three people at the far end who didn't improve at all. We didn't do anything useful for them. So it's not a perfect panacea. But if you think in medicine, the numbers needed to treat for statins are about 140. The numbers needed to treat for cognitive therapy for social anxiety disorder are slightly less than two. So these are potent compared to many of the interventions that we have in physical medicine. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is it's all pretty pointless. You do these research studies, you get lots of prizes, you get salary increases in England, but what's the point? There isn't really a point because in most of our countries, most people don't benefit from those treatments. And of course, that's why the research is done. Um, and it's not as though the public doesn't want these things. So there are 32 surveys of public preference done in many different Western countries. And they all show essentially the same result. That if you say, would you, if you're offered a choice between an evidence-based psychological therapy and an evidence-based medication, what would be your preference? And of course, some people say, oh, I'd like the medication. But in a ratio of three to one, people favor psychological treatments. And in no country is the, treat, is the public getting what it wants. There is no single country where psychological treatments are more widely available than medication. And then when psychological treatments are available, they're often not the evidence-based interventions for that particular condition. Uh, in England, when we started the program I'm going to show you in 2008, it was estimated that only 5% of people with depression or anxiety disorders were offered an evidence-based psychological treatment of any sort, which is outrageous. Um, so the English Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, or IAP program, was set about to try and change that unfairness, that inequality. Um, and it aims to vastly increase the public availability of nice recommended psychological therapies, so not just CBT, the range of those therapies. And it took the view that the big reason why people can't get these therapies is we don't have enough trained therapists. So in a sense, it's a training exercise. It planned to train a large number of additional psychological therapists and then deploy them in specialized um, step care psychological therapy services. Um, step care is a principle where not everyone will go for a conventional face-to-face -face therapy once a week. Uh, for some people, the more mild to moderate cases, the research shows they can do very well with what we call guided self-help, where they may have a computer program they're working with and then have someone contact them each week to guide them through it, or some other low-level interventions, low-level in terms of therapist time, like a psychoeducation group. And the idea is uh, many people with a more mild end of the spectrum would be offered that first, but if they don't respond to that, then they're stepped up uh, fairly promptly to face-to-face -face therapy. And that becomes a, a more efficient way of delivering the treatment economically. It also means patients don't have to travel so often to the clinic because some of the support is on the telephone. Um, this was going to be a big initiative, and so the government quite rightly said, we want to know whether it works. So the program also commits to collecting outcome data on everyone who has a course of treatment and publishing that data. So there is full public transparency. If you Google common mental health disorders profiles tool, you will be able to see the outcomes of every IAP service in England while I'm talking. And of course, that means all mental health sufferers can do the same. Um, how did it come about? Well, big programs like this always have multiple routes. Um, NICE was cri really critical, having an impartial body that had issued some clinical guidance. 
Um, and then a critical issue seemed to be bringing together both economic arguments and clinical arguments. Um, Richard Layard, um, the man in the middle there with the yellow tie, a very distinguished eco economist, uh, and I got together and put together an argument for why it would uh, be economically as well as clinically sensible to do the IAP program. Um, we wrote a report, a pamphlet called the Depression Report, and that was distributed uh, in uh, every copy of one of the national newspapers uh, one Sunday. We got a benefactor to kindly pay for that. We also talked very closely to the patient um, organizations, the voluntary charities that look after patient interests, and asked them, is this something that they wanted? And they said yes, but with a couple of twists, and so they got their twists. And then they produced their own document called We Need to Talk, which essentially also argued, but from a patient's perspective, for the same initiative. And these two documents were issued in the same week, three days apart, in order to control the media for a week. Uh, and these arguments were thankfully listened to. Uh, the Prime Minister at the time was Gordon Brown, and he agreed to start the program in a very small way, in a small number of sites and see whether it worked out. But it did, as you'll see, get very good results. And so when the government was changed to a coalition, David Cameron and Nick Clegg, um, they uh, agreed to expand it further. And then when we got to the next election in 2015, we thought we should write a book. And so Thrive was written for the people who are writing the election manifestos for all the political parties. And like Tina, they were given it to take away on their summer holiday and read. And they all came back and included a commitment to IAPT in their election manifestos. So uh, they obviously had an enjoyable summer holiday. Um, and um, we've really put all the economic and clinical arguments that we used in that book. And we hope they're relevant to you. I know um, in uh, uh, the Netherlands, they've been thought to be very relevant. And I think they apply across most Western countries. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I'll mention some of the key arguments. The first is just to help people understand how big an issue mental health is. And this is World Health Organization just looking at uh, disability related to different illnesses. And you can see um, mental health is one of the very biggest players. About 38% of all illnesses are mental health problems. That's more than heart disease, stroke, cancer, lung disease, and diabetes combined and almost as much as all the other physical health problems. But it is also economically incredibly significant. So this is World Health Organization data looking at the extent to which um, any form of disability uh, is related to mental health problems rather than physical health problems, so health-related disability. And what you'll notice is if you're looking at the working age population, um, the largest contributor to disability in the working age population is mental health. So much so that it is estimated for most Western countries, untreated anxiety and depression depresses our gross domestic product by about four percentage points. About half of that is people um, who have anxiety and depression uh, no longer working. And about half of it is people in work, but their mind being somewhere else on their worries and their concerns. And so being less productive is what we call presenteeism. So every nation is losing a vast amount of money by untreated anxiety and depression. Um, and it also means, of course, that if we want enough money as a society to, to deal with the illnesses that tend to get us later in life, cancer, cardiovascular disease, um, some of the illnesses of retirement. We won't have that money in our economy unless we address mental health problems and therefore allow our economy to thrive in the way that it should do. So really critical. There is another important argument um, which many people in a more political domain are understandably interested in. There's quite a lot of research that shows that one of the main determinants of how we vote in elections is our perception of our current well-being. 
Um, and there's a big question, well, what are the determinants of well-being? Well, this is a large European study that looked at people's ratings of their satisfaction with their life in their mid-30s. And uh, what you've got here is partial correlation coefficients. So these are variables which all significantly correlate, and uniquely so, because it's a partial correlation, uh, with uh, life satisfaction. So if you earn more money, you tend to, on average, to be more satisfied. If you're in a job, you tend to be uh, more satisfied. Um, in a place like this, it's quite useful to know that the more education you've had, the more satisfied you are. That's nice for universities. Um, if you're uh, married or cohabiting, the more satisfied you are. Um, if you're not a criminal, you notice the negative thing there, uh, the more satisfied you are with life. So if any of you are thinking of an alternative career, don't go that way. Um, and also, if we look at health, you obviously want to look at that some distance in the past, so it's not a tautologous relationship. But if you look at it um, eight years earlier, better physical health uh, is also a help. But the big player here, you can see the size of the partial correlation, much bigger than the rest, is your previous mental health history. So it is really important, both economically and for other political reasons, for society to address mental health problems. Um, there's another reason why it's important, and that is when we're short of money, it's economic stupidity not to deal with mental health. Why is that? Well, because the net cost of making psychological treatments more available is zero or even less than that. So Richard Layard and I calculated at the time of the program that it would cost about 735 euros to treat each person with a step care system. Um, but we calculated that the benefits to the government in terms of uh, reduced uh, unemployment benefits and increased tax revenues for people being back at work would on its own pay for that. But also, People with anxiety and depression have much higher physical health care costs. They get many more investigations than other people. Also, if they've got a long-term condition like diabetes, the diabetes itself costs 50% more to manage if you're depressed than if you're not. So there are big physical health care savings, and they also, we calculated, would exceed that. This was published in the Treasury's own journal, um, and the argument was accepted. Uh, we got the cost slightly wrong. Uh, it's actually 773 euros today at least, uh, but pretty close. And the savings seem to be coming in too. So um, what was the plan? Well, we started small in 2008 uh, with just about 15% of the country having IAP services. Um, and then we gradually built up and expanded the coverage of the country as we're able to train more therapists. And um, the government has committed to us training at least 16,000 new therapists by the end of the current commitment, which is 2024. Um, and um, they, the idea is that they deliver nice recommended treatments, and you'll see what they are in a minute. Um, psychological treatments are more tricky to, de to deliver than medication. With medication, unless you have a corrupt drug company, the tablet always has the right amount of the chemical in it. But with psychological therapies, unless it's delivered by someone who is properly trained and closely supervised and has their outcomes monitored and gets the chance to have further co continuing professional development uh, training, then you won't get the outcomes that you get in the randomized controlled trials and you're much more likely to be delivering something closer to a placebo. So you need to pay good attention to training and make sure everyone has the opportunity to have a really good training. And so a key bit of the program was to publish national curricula for every one of the therapies with the content closely aligned to what was delivered in the uh, definitive randomized controlled trials to develop a competence framework so that as people go through the training, we can assess whether they've acquired the skills necessary to deliver that particular therapy. And people only finish the training uh, when they've demonstrated that in videotapes from live therapy sessions. So it's a very much competence-based training. 
Um, and when the government announced the initiative, it did something unusual in mental health. It didn't just say a certain number of people will be seen and we'll try and get them to be seen as quickly as possible, which is what you normally do when you're trying to improve mental health services. It went one step further. It said, and 50% of those people will recover. I'd actually told the minister that I thought we could do that, but he, but he was told not to announce that by his civil servants because it was thought it might be very difficult because it's about what you get in the randomized control trials. But bless his heart, he got up and announced it to the nation. And so we all had to work hard to deliver it. And as you can see, you'll find out it was quite hard work, but we've got there. Um, but of course, from a patient point of view, it is the right thing. What they care about is, do they get better? That's what it's all about. So it's what we should be looking at. Um, in order to make sure we got data on everyone, we use a session-by-session -session outcome monitoring system. So people have a very simple measure of anxiety and depression each time they're seen. Not in the therapy session itself, we don't want to waste therapy time on it, but often in the waiting room or you fill it in before you come into the session or on your phone. Um, and um, by using that system, we, even if someone drops out of therapy early, you've still got a clinical endpoint so you know how they've done. So that's the idea. Where are we up to so far? Well, we think it is transforming the treatment of anxiety and depression in England, uh, but it's a work in progress. We haven't finished. As you'll see, we've still got some way to go. But we do now have these IAP services in every area of the country. They're called, uh, we divide the health service up into what we call clinical commissioning groups, or CCGs. So those are our units, and there are just over 200 of them. Um, and currently we're seeing just over one million people per year in the services. Um, and this is how the program's grown. So right in the first year we saw only about 200,000 and not in all areas of the country. But as you can see we've steadily increased as we've trained our workforce to over a million now. Um, now, not everyone gets a full course of treatment. Some people get an assessment and some advice. They may also be signposted somewhere else that's maybe more appropriate, like housing aid or debt counselling or something like that. But round about 560,000 people currently um, uh, get a course of treatment. And they thought it's appropriate for them to have that. And that's our target group for collecting outcome data. So we say, if you've been seen at least twice, although, of course, most people have seen many more times than that, we have to collect your data and report it. And even if you were only seen twice and you said, I didn't like the service and dropped out, we still have to collect your data and report it. So what you're going to see is data from that whole cohort of people. Um, and currently, uh, we're able to record pre- and post-treatment measures of anxiety, depression, and disability, uh, linked to your mental health problem in 99.2% of that 560,000 people. So we have pretty complete data. You might say, that sounds a bit obsessional. Do you really need that amount of data? And of course, when we started, a lot of people said, don't get so hung up on the data. You don't really need all of that. And, you know, we are collecting data and we get it on some people. In fact, what we found at that time in a national audit was 38% of people with psychological treatment who got measures at the beginning and end of treatment. And a lot of people said, well, it would be nice to have you know, data from more people, but we shouldn't worry about it because the people who don't give us data, it's just random. And so we can safely assume that the people who we don't get data from have improved just as much. And that's an empirical question. It could have been correct, couldn't it? But we thought we'd better check it out. So in a pilot for IAPT, um, in two areas, uh, we ran two systems in parallel. Uh, we had the traditional system for collecting data. You give a questionnaire at the beginning of treatment, and you give one at the end, but not in between. And then, of course, you get a lot of missing data because people finish at a time you didn't anticipate. But then we also gave people, with our different measures, the session by session. And in the session by session, we got data on everyone. In the traditional measure at the beginning and end, we got data on only 50% of people. So we can now answer the question, when you have missing data, does it matter? And this slide shows it matters an enormous amount. So if you look at the people who um, 
had a missing data at the end of treatment on the conventional system, uh, and you look at how much they've improved in their anxiety and depression, that's the uh, yellow bar, you can see they've only improved 40% as much as the people who you get data from. So this persuaded us and the government that we are simply deluding ourselves about how good our services are if we have missing data. So quite rightly, the government said, well, if we're going to invest, we do want you to get the data on everyone. We do need to know what's happening. So that's what we've been doing since then. Um, what is the treatment? Um, well, I said it was a step care system. So um, on average, just over a third of people will get the low intensity treatment only, do well with that, and so not need to be stepped up. Things like guided self-help, psychoeducation groups. About 38% of people, they get the low and the high, so they've been stepped up. And then just over a quarter of people go straight into high intensity treatment. Those are the more severe cases. Uh, what are the treatments? Well, um, CBT is the most common uh, treatment. It accounts for 57% of all the uh, high intensive face-to-face -face therapy sessions. Uh, and that's because it has the broadest indication in NICE. It's covered all the anxiety disorders and depression. But in depression, we tried to offer a choice, and in 93% of the, all the IAP services, patients have a choice of at least two different psychological treatments for depression. The most common choice at the moment is between counselling and um, CBT, but we are also offering brief psychodynamic therapy, IPT, couples therapy, and for PTSD, EMDR as well. So where have we got to in terms of the outcomes? Well, um, the first thing is that this step care system and the extra therapists have dramatically changed waiting times. So it was pretty common to have to wait for a year before a course of psychological treatment, before IAPT. Now the average waiting time is 20 days. So that's a really big difference. What are the outcomes like? Well, currently, uh, Approximately seven in every 10 treated patients, it's actually 68%, show reliable and substantial reductions in their anxiety and depression. And in five out of 10, it's currently 52%, that reduction is so large that we code them as recovered. What that means, it's a bit arbitrary, is that their symptoms have gone below the clinical threshold for both anxiety and depression. We say for both, because we're not treating syndromes, we're treating people. So we want them to be generally better. Um, we also, though, find, as you do in every area of health when you measure it, that there's regional variation. Some services are doing better than others. You get the same with cardiac surgery. You get the same with cancer survival rates. That's not a surprise that it's there in mental health as well. But the key thing is, can we learn from that variability? And we have learned an enormous amount about how to deliver these treatments effectively by systematically studying that variability and then feeding what we've learned from that back into the system so we can all benefit from that learning. Um, so this is what's happened to our recovery rates. So you see the minister announced 50% uh, in 2009. We didn't get there at the beginning. We were around about 40%. And you can see it's taken us quite a few years to get there, but we're comfortably there now. And we have been there every month for the last 24 months. And we've now got some services that are operating at 65%. So we now know we, in practice we can do better than the trials. And we're sort of carrying on moving onwards. But it's been a big learning process and a big sharing process between all the services involved. So what are the, some of the things that we've learned? Oh, this shows you the variability. Um, and um, it's also shown how the learning has allowed some of those services that weren't doing so well earlier on to really improve. So what I've plotted here is the number of services, the total that we're interested in is around about 200, that were over 50% recovery, uh, uh, going back four years, and the number that were under 40%, which we think is really, we shouldn't be under 40%. And you can see four years ago, we had 47 of the 200 below 40%. Last year we had only six, and this morning we have only four, as we released some new data today. Um, so this is an extraordinary transformation, isn't it? Really raising all the boats to get much more consistent uh, outcomes. Um, and if we hadn't the data, we wouldn't have known that. 
and we'd still have 47 at 40 percent. Um, what are some of the other findings? Well, there's some controversy about clinical guidelines. Some of us like to ski off piste in our holidays, and when we're doing therapy, we sometimes think we'd like to do the same rather than following some guidelines. And that makes a lot of sense. But the question is, how does it work out for our patients? And IAPT is a massive experiment to look at this. And so we have some examples where quite large numbers of people got a treatment that wasn't in line with the guidance. And in general, when that happens, we find that people do benefit from those treatments, but not as much as if they got the guideline recommended treatment. And you can see this here. This is one of the early studies. We found that in depression, CBT and counseling both got very good results. And NICE recommends them both. So that was very good. Um, in generalized anxiety disorder, um, NICE does not recommend counseling, but it does recommend CBT. Many of my counseling colleagues say, but we get good results with generalized anxiety disorder. And they're right. 46% of patients who got counseling uh, for generalized anxiety disorder recovered. But what they didn't know is if they'd had CBT, it would have been 59%. So it makes a difference. And if you look at the lower intensity work, self-help, we do not recommend just giving books for people to go through. We recommend guided self-help where you have a clinician who contacts you every week and helps guide you through the program. And that made a vast difference to the outcomes. Um, we have also um, looked at uh, other characteristics of services which might predict better or worse clinical outcomes. Um, and uh, this is a paper we published last year in The Lancet uh, where we identified a series of variables which are associated with a particular clinical service getting a higher overall recovery or improvement rate compared to another. So, and these are independent variables. So the first one is problem descriptor completeness. The clinicians here are not psychiatrists, they're not doing formal psychiatric diagnoses. But we do ask them to be able to identify what they think the main problem is that they're treating. And that's roughly aligned to clinical categories. So are you seeing yourself as largely treating PTSD with some secondary depression? Are you seeing yourself as more treating social anxiety? Um, are you seeing yourself as more treating obsessive compulsive disorder? We think this is important because the clinical guidelines differ between these different conditions. But in my profession, clinical psychology, we've had a controversy about this sort of thing for years. And some people say it's really evil to categorize things that way and they don't do it. And other people think, no, it does make sense to have an idea of what the focus is. And so in our services, at least initially, we had big variability. In some services, no patient got a problem descriptor identified. And in some other services, 100% did. What we found is that that matters a lot. Those services that have high problem descriptor completeness rates get much better outcomes. Probably because they're guiding the treatment more. As a consequence, as you'll see in a minute, we don't have any services now that don't do that at all, and most of them do it quite a lot. Um, just like with medication, there's a dose-response effect. Those services that, on average, give a higher dose of psychological therapy get better outcomes. The average dose, again, the best outcomes, is not very high. It's around about nine. But there's a big range there. Quite a lot of people are responding with many less, and so you're getting people with 20, 25 sessions as well to give you that average. Um, how long you wait for therapy turns out to be critical. And you see that on the left-hand graph here. So what we've plotted here is each blue dot is uh, all the patients treated in an IAP service in a year. So each dot represents about 7,000 patients. And what we're plotting is how long, on average, patients have to wait to start treatment in that service, uh, that's along the bottom, and along the side, what's their chance of recovering if, when they get the treatment. And you can see um, that initially, for the first six weeks or so, it doesn't actually matter how long you wait, you still have a very good chance of recovering. But once it gets beyond six weeks, your chance of recovering reduces when you get essentially the same treatment. So there's a window of opportunity. 
For many people, it's a big deal coming forward for psychological therapy. You know you're going to have to do some painful, emotionally challenging work. That's what happens in therapy. And so people aren't always open to that opportunity. And we interpret this, but it is an interpretation, because it's correlational, that we have to really seize that window of opportunity. The government has taken this seriously and it has set a six-week target for people starting treatment in IAPT based on this graph. Um, well, those are correlations, of course. Um, in psychology, we're not impressed by correlations alone. We want to get at more causal uh, explanations. And in this case, we can get part way there by looking at if a service changes on any of these variables, does it improve its outcomes? So I've uh, looked here at changes in the whole system between 2015 and 2018. You can see we're getting much better at problem descriptor completeness. The average number of sessions are creeping up. The average waiting time is going down. But the key thing is that when you put all of those into a multiple regression, uh, you get a very nice uh, way of explaining why the services on average in that period of time are getting better in their outcomes. It is partly paying attention to these variables. Um, one thing I didn't mention was social deprivation. Um, what we find, on average, um, is that those patients who live in a more socially deprived area, their outcomes from the psychological therapy service are not so good, if you look at it in a univariate way. When I was a student, there were two ways people would think about that. One was to think, oh, well, if you're in a socially deprived area, then it's really the deprived environment that is mainly determining your mental health problems, and psychology isn't going to do much for you. The alternative view is that in most of our societies, if we live in a deprived area, we're deprived of many things, and it might include a quality psychological therapy service as well. The latter idea, of course, suggests that we can finesse the effects of social deprivation if we make sure that in socially deprived areas people get really good quality, well-funded services. And in the Lancet paper, in our analysis, that turned out to be correct. The effect of social deprivation almost completely disappeared when we control for these other quality variables. But I'd like to show you a rather cutesy little example of this. So in England, we have two areas more or less next to each other. Um, and they are both, uh, so one of them is Windsor, Ascot and Maidenhead. Windsor is where the Queen has her weekend castle and where the Prime Minister has her constituency. And this is not a deprived area of the country. It's on the fourth percentile for social deprivation. But next to it is an area called Slough, which, at least in the south of England, is one of the most deprived areas. It's the 68th percentile, and a very mixed ethnic community. But they are both served by a single, very high-quality IAP service. And you can see that the outcomes for the both of them are above the national expectation, 56% uh, in Windsor, 58% in Slough. So if for any reason the Queen ever did feel that she wanted to go to an IAP service, we might suggest that she asked the chauffeur to drive her a little bit along the road to Slough. Uh, so it really is possible to finesse the effects of social deprivation, but you've got to get the psychology right. So all of these lessons, and it's been an extraordinary journey for us learning many of these things, are in a manual, uh, the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies manual, and you can download that yourself from the NHS England website if you'd like, and have a look at There's many more lessons in it as well. Um, but I'd like to sort of wind up by saying, well, where's the program going to now? Well, it's a program which has been sponsored by three different governments, all of different political persuasions a Labour government, rather more on the left wing, uh, a coalition, which was centrist, and a Conservative government, which is somewhat more on the right wing. But each government has been impressed by the fact that we can deliver outcomes that matter to patients. We can get people better, and we can do it in an economic way. And as a consequence, each government has expanded the programme. And uh, as of one month ago, the current government 
announced the, in, uh, the long-term plan for the NHS and has committed us to move from our current position of seeing just over a million people a year to see 1.9 million people by 2024. And this would not have happened without the combined economic and clinical argument and all of the wonderful therapists of the different modalities in the IAP service working together to achieve the outcomes and be transparent about what we achieve and learning when things don't go so well about how we can improve things. So expansion is certainly a big part of the future agenda. There are two others. One of the big research areas in psychotherapy is digital delivery. Um, quite a number of people find they benefit quite a lot from online delivered uh, therapy programs, often with the assistance of a therapist. Um, and also, some people um, find that it's difficult to get to clinics, they live in more remote areas or something like that, but they can have their therapy over a video conferencing system. So those are two things we're bringing in to improve patient convenience. Um, the other thing is really a moment in history for us. All of my lifetime, we've treated physical health and mental health separately. Um, and that doesn't make sense for many patients. 40% of people with anxiety and depression also have a long-term physical health problem. Diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, chronic pain, uh, some uh, cancers as well. And that's a double handicap. And how do we deal with that? Well, if people are lucky, they get an appointment to see their physical health care problems dealt with over that side of the city and their mental health problem over that side of the city. That's quite a struggle to get to both and many people don't manage it. And if they get to both, we can guarantee that the person who's dealing with their physical health won't talk to the person dealing with their mental health and they won't get an integrated treatment program. Well, this is a strange Cartesian dualism that makes no sense at all. Um, and so we're now trying to change that. So we're starting to develop what we call integrated IAP services, where if you have a long-term physical health problem, your IAP therapist sees you in the same place where your physical health care occurs. And they talk to the physicians, and the physicians talk to them, and they have cups of coffee together, and they plan things together. Um, and that's working out really very well, uh, and we're finding great savings in physical health care costs from those services. And so we're planning to expand them much more as part of the current government commitment. So that's really what we're doing. Um, it has attracted some international interest. Um, and um, in general, it's been pretty positive. The world's leading science journal, Nature, had an editorial on the program describing it as world-beating. The New York Times, the Americans tend not to be so favorable about the English NHS, but the New York Times had a long feature-length article on IAPT, which was really essentially very positive, describing it as the world's most ambitious attempt to treat depression, anxiety, and other common mental health problems. And the Canadians, who are looking to reform their mental health system, had an editorial in the equivalent of the New York Times, the Globe and Mail, which was more simply stated, for better mental health care in Canada, look to Britain. And the Arab states are also looking in a similar direction. Um, of course, that's just sort of journalists, but a number of countries are now developing their own, with their own twists, IAP services. Norway now has 40 IAP services, getting very good outcomes. Um, half of Stockholm has got an IAP system now. Um, Israel, three weeks ago, announced a national pilot uh, of the IAP program. Australia has quite a number of IAP-like services. Um, and Los Angeles now has set up an IAP program in a particularly deprived area of uh, the state. Um, so a lot of countries are thinking the same way, that it is possible to realize the mass public benefit of psychological therapies, and it's possible to do it in a cost-effective way and a publicly transparent way in which all those people whose lives are blighted by mental health really have a chance to know there is hope and that things can change and it really is possible to recover. So it's worth lobbying more for these things and coming forward for treatment. 
So I'd like to more or less wind up by just mentioning some of the lessons that I've learned uh, from the IAP program. So my primary job um, is as a researcher. I spend most of my life trying to develop more effective treatments. And when I had sort of a dark color to my hair, um, I had this sort of idealistic view that if you worked really hard at your research, you did all the experiments in the lab, you worked out what it is that keeps the psychological problem going, and then you developed a very targeted psychological therapy which would hit it, you could get good results, and then you'd do a good randomized control trial, and you'd publish in a distinguished journal, and everyone will read it, you can go on holiday, and the health service will just start delivering it. Well, this really was the idiocy of youth. It just doesn't work like that. Um, and, you know, there aren't drug companies that are, that are sponsoring all these treatments. It's precious research resources that are spent on this. And there isn't really money to just do all this implementation. So we as professionals need to work to do it ourselves. Um, and that's been one of the big lessons for me. It really helps if you get some broad agreement on clinical guidelines. No guideline is perfect. I don't know anyone in mental health who fully agrees with any of the nice guidelines, but we think they're good compromises. Um, it really helps a lot to get outcome data on everyone. It's a treasure. You learn so many things you didn't know from looking at the data. And of course, it, it allows the funding to be released because people can see it's worth funding you. Um, it is very important to pay attention to the economics. As we are starting the, the program, we spent more time in the Treasury than we did in the Department of Health. Because all governments are strapped for cash, and they need to know that this makes sense economically as well as clinically. But it really does make sense economically. Um, and we do need to pay attention to getting the quality right. So national training programs, we found, really helped us. This data collection mustn't be a burden to the clinicians. So you need an IT system that supports it in an effortless way. You need to train people so they uh, can use the outcome data to guide their therapy sessions session by session, not just being monitored from above, but to find it clinically useful. And without that, obviously, people won't be interested in it. Um, and. Um, the quality of the leadership in these services is really incredibly important. If people are stepping up to the plate and having outcomes measured, and by the way, we don't report individual therapists' outcome data, we just report the outcome of a whole service, um, then it is very important that that is dealt with in a respectful way. People shouldn't feel that they're being evaluated because of this. They should, in fact, be working in an environment where you have leadership, where everyone is interested in the data because it allows us as professionals to do what we got into the business from, which is learning a little bit more from our data and gradually improving our practice in a supportive environment with good supervision. And so you have to create these innovation environments that people like to work in and really are on a journey together. And then it really sings. And it doesn't always work that way. Some of our services aren't like that. So we have to work quite hard on training people in clinical leadership to create those environments as well. So thank you so much for listening.